Good morning, everybody. Uh, just to say we're going to be starting the webinar in a couple of minutes, just to allow everyone to join. Morning, everybody. Just to say, we're going to be starting in a couple of minutes. Uh, so, uh, hope you're sitting comfortably. People are still joining, so I'm gonna give it uh, probably about 90 more seconds before we start. So good morning, everybody. I'm now going to start the event uh, and welcome to the launch of the European Red List of Birds. Uh, I am Martin Harper. I'm the Regional Director for BirdLife in Europe and Central Asia, uh, and I'm going to chair this event today. For those of you who don't know BirdLife, we're a family of 150 national NGOs covering all continents around the world, and within my region, we have partners operating in 45 countries. To set up the session, uh, I am today going to explain the format of the, today's event. I'm gonna give you some housekeeping details, uh, and then I'm going to provide some opening remarks to provide a bit of context. I should say that this meeting is being recorded. Um, and after my introduction, there will be four speeches from my colleague Anastasia Neva, who is the acting head of conservation in my region for bird life, uh, and she will present the headline results. After that, we'll have Ian Burfield, who's bird life's global science coordinator, who will consider the scientific implications of the new red list. We then have a talk from Mikael O'Brien, who is the uh, deputy head of the nature unit at DG Environment in the European Commission. And Mikael will give a overview of the policy implications. And then finally, we'll have Sylvia Ursel from the Society for the Protection of Birds and Nature in Moldova, who will offer a grassroots perspective about what the report means for national conservation efforts. After the talks, we'll then open up for questions, which can be posted using the Q&A function, which you can see uh, in the middle of the bottom of your screen there. Uh, you can also vote on the questions um, that you want to ask, uh, and I shall try my best to get through as many questions as possible in the time available. Um, you won't be able to use the chat function, but you can, of course, comment on social media using hashtag redlist. Uh, I shall probably repeat all of this uh, when we get through the speeches. But to set a bit of context, I wanted to say a few things. This week, Talks have been taking place in China about a new global deal for nature. And yesterday, over 100 countries signed the so-called Kunming Declaration. And this represents a small but significant step towards agreeing next April what we hope will be an ambitious plan to tackle the crisis facing nature. And it is a crisis. 
It is a crisis that is biting all around the world. And according to IPBES, a risk of a million species going extinct unless we take rapid action. The UN's Convention on Biological Diversity has a goal for humans to live in harmony with nature, which to my mind means we need to keep common species common and prevent threatened species from becoming extinct. And that will then allow us as humans to continue to benefit from the services provided by a healthy natural environment, pollination, clean water, flood protection, a stable climate, recreation and inspiration. And so by assessing the extinction risk of 544 wild bird species in Europe, the update to the European Red List that we launched today shows how we're doing in meeting the CBD goal to um, by using birds as the most visible and best studied indicators of biodiversity. And as you will hear from Anna in a moment, the results clearly demonstrate that we're failing to manage our land, our fresh water and our seas sustainably. We want and need Europe to be leading the world in restoring nature. We have the knowledge, the opportunity and the responsibility to do it. But today's report shows the scale of this challenge. Yes, we have politicians now competing for global leadership on biodiversity. We have the leaders pledge for nature. We have a high ambition coalition calling for 30% of the planet to be protected and we hope well managed for nature. And this leadership is new and a good thing. But words, what Greta Thunberg has called blah, 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 must be backed up by action. And it is patently clear that we need nothing short of a transformation to our economy if we are able to deal with this crisis. As BirdLife's chief executive, Patricia Zurita, said yesterday in her address to the CBD ministerial meeting in China, we need a new economic system that's based on nature. This means a food and farming system based on nature, an energy system powered by nature and our own well-being nurtured by nature. And this transformation must begin now in what the UN has called the decade of ecological restoration. And of course, at a time when the world is still dealing and hoping to recover from the health and economic crisis created by the pandemic. So at next April's global summit, we shall need the world to agree ambitious targets for nature, but then the hard work really begins to translate that ambition into EU and national legislation with plans backed up by the right funding and crucially, the right policies. Too often we have environment ministries setting off on the right path, only for that path then to be blocked or bulldozed over by other political interests. This has to change. We all, politicians, business and civil society have to step up and do better. It's our challenge for the decade, and the new Red List provides the stimulus for action. But we should embark on this challenge with confidence and optimism. As you will hear, conservation action has helped to reduce the extinction risk of some of our most threatened species. And this has come about thanks to the application of science to understand the reasons of decline, testing solutions to see what works, and then rolling out those solutions. This takes expertise and determination because many of these wins, wins are hard won over many decades. But we have shown that a targeted approach to nature conservation works. So we now need to intensify our efforts and deliver change quicker and on, on a bigger scale. And that takes courage and creativity. It's what we need to do and it's what nature needs us to do. The 2021 update of the European Red List for birds has been a huge endeavour and Anna will give due thanks to our funders, partners and experts who have helped us with this project. But I also want to give credit to those that's led it, particularly Anna, to Ian and another colleague who you won't see today, Claire Rutherford. I want to thank and congratulate all of you on this publication. And so now I want to hand over to Anna who's going to give an overview of the results. Over to you, Anna. Good morning, everyone. What an exciting moment. 
I'm just sharing my screen. Apologies. Okay, now you should be able to see the slides. So good morning, everyone. It's um, really an exciting day, an exciting moment. For me and my colleagues who work on this project, it's a symbolic uh, closure of a project, of a three years project, uh, which was both challenging and demanding. At the same time, we're launching this publication today with very high hopes that the results of it will be widely used and that uh, they will help all of us in achieving our goals in preserving nature for the generations to come. And before I start uh, with an overview of the results of our report, I would like to thank all of you who are joining us today. I know that many of you are among the people who contributed to, the, to this report, the people who dedicated their time, knowledge and data to contribute to this amazing um, and important work, which uh, involved thousands of volunteers and experts across Europe. I would like also to thank um, those who are not joining us today, but I know that they will follow very closely our work and they will also benefit from this work. And especially to thank uh, the European Commission for the opportunity to deliver this important European Red List of Birds. And especially to thank um, Angelica Rubin and her team at DG Environment, who were extremely uh, patient and understanding and supporting to us throughout the process. As well as I would like to um, thank our colleagues at the IUCN, uh, who were part of this project together with BirdLife International and BirdLife Europe. So, um, to bring a bit of light um, to what is the European Red List of Birds and why it is important. The European Red List of Birds is a review of the extinction risk of European birds, those occurring regularly and naturally in Europe. Therefore, species which are vagrant or species uh, which have been introduced by people are not covered in this report. We have assessed 544 species of birds, uh, either during the breeding or the wintering season. And to do this, we have followed the IUCN Red List categories and criteria and apply them at the regional level. This exercise is the fourth in a row uh, which BirdLife International performs after the 1994, 2004, and the 2015 assessments. So when we compare at a few points um, our results in this report, we'll refer especially to the results in 2015. And as I already mentioned, um, this report is based on data provided by thousands of experts and volunteers across Europe from 54 countries and territories, from Greenland and Svalbard and Jan to European part of Russia, the Mediterranean islands of Cyprus, Malta, and uh, Atlantic islands of Portugal and Spain. Thank you all for your contribution. And also we are very helpful, very hopeful that our results will inform decision-making at regional level, but also at national level, uh, that our results will help shaping national, international environmental policies and also on the ground conservation action. And let's see, what our report says then. The results of the European Red List update in 2021 show that a fifth of all bird species that we have in Europe are threatened or near threatened with extinction. Within this, we have 13% of species or 71 species which are threatened, 
meaning that the species have rapidly declining populations or small populations, small range or declining range, and they are at the highest risk of extinction. But another 34 species or 6% of all bird species in Europe are near threatened, meaning that they're close to become of high extinction risk or threatened. To give some examples, or maybe starting first with the species that we have already lost, I would like to um, tell you about a few species that um, are not anymore present in Europe. Two of these species used to occur in Europe in past centuries, but long time ago have uh, disappeared. These are the Canarian oyster catcher and great oak, and therefore are not covered in this report under assessment. But there are five species which we have lost at regional level much more recently. And among them, the bird on the picture you see is the palace sand grouse, but also the northern wild ibis, for which we acknowledge that significant effort is being put in place across Europe to return these species into our habitats. And other species are the African darter, common butter quail, and pine bunting, among those that are now regionally extinct. But we have some good news and um, two species which were previously classified as regionally extinct are now considered endangered or vulnerable, respectively. And these are the Caspian plover and desert warbler. Why is this? Um, it is because we have better knowledge and new observation uh, data is showing us that these species are still present. And we hope that maybe they can still uh, recover. Three other species are critically endangered, but possibly extinct. This means that we suspect that may have disappeared already from our region, but uh, we are giving them a bit more time as in science is, many, uh, is quite often more difficult to prove that species are not present rather than present. So uh, before classifying them as um, extinct species for the region, we are going to hope for some new data to come. And these are Asian Hubara, the slender billed curlew, and the Pechora pipit. Looking at the species which are more threatened in Europe, um, you see on the screen some of these uh, species presenting different um, groups of birds. They are critically endangered, which means that they are rapidly de declining or they have very small populations or maybe even both. Um, these, among these species are the steppe eagle, the red knob good, and the yellow breasted bunting, as well as the endemic or breeding only in Europe, Balearic shearwater, and the sociable lapwing. Some other species have changed their status compared to the previous assessment in 2015. And um, among them is the Demoiselle crane, the species uh, which picture we have um, on the cover page of the report. Uh, new data shows that the population of the species is much smaller than previously believed, but it's also rapidly declining. Another beautiful species, which is now endangered, is the common adder which is suffering decline in its um, Icelandic and Scandinavian populations. Although in some other parts, we may see um, some uh, increases of the population. There are lots of threats which this bird is, threat is uh, facing. And among them is the decline of fish stock, but also natural threats as, um, for example, uh, the threat by natural predators. One of the surprises for us, uh, probably for many, is the now threatened status of the rook, 
a species that is common in our parks and gardens and also uh, we can see on arable land. The rook is legally and illegally persecuted in many countries and its nests are being destroyed. And this is very likely the main reason why the species is undergoing rapid declines in at least 50% of its population. Another common species is the quail, which has suffered in the last few decades significant decrease in, their, in its population due to intensific intensification of agriculture and um, therefore decline in the plants and seeds that this bird uses for um, food. And now moving to uh, the trends because you may think one in five species is threatened by extinction, but what about the other four? Does this mean that the reminder of species are doing well? Well, actually our results tell us that this is not exactly the case because a third of all the species in Europe are declining, have declining populations. And for many species we have lost indeed a third of their populations or less or more during a decade even or less than a human lifetime lifespan. What is also interesting is that one in four species or a quarter of all species in Europe have an unknown trend. This means that we don't know much about what is happening with the species, which automatically classifies it as least concern. This means that in the future, if we have new data coming about these species, very likely a proportion of these quarter of species which now have a known trend will may be classified as threatened or near threatened. So when we say that one in five species in Europe are threatened by extinction, we should keep in mind that this is at least one in five species that are um, threatened. And when looking at a particular species of birds, um, we see patterns in declines among some of them in particular. For example, over 40% of wild fowl and wader species have declining trends. Among these, uh, ducks have a lot of, um, uh, have at least 50% of the species of ducks are experiencing declines. And over 30% of seabirds, as well as a quarter of the raptors, are in decline. But what is worrying is also that common species of passerines, among these larks, shrikes, buntings, as well as, as dits and sparrows, finches and flycatchers, have declining populations. We also notice that migratory birds um, are experiencing declines over 30% of the birds that migrate are in decline compared to those which are resident. And we, through looking through these groups of birds, we can already um, think about the threats that are occurring in their habitats. For example, farmland and grassland habitats have the highest number of associated threatened and near threatened species and are closely followed by marine habitats with 28 species. We also see that inland wetlands and followed by forest and shrub are the um, are the habitats which have the following higher number of associated threatened and near threatened species. These results are supported by uh, the number of associated species with declining trends. And we see that again, environment and grassland, as well as the marine habitat, are the ones that have the highest proportion of species with declining trends. These um, results show us that there are issues in the habitats uh, in which species occur. They're big general problems 
large-scale land use changes and the intensification of agricultural practices, as well as development of infrastructure, overexploitation of marine and forest resources, the pollution of waters. These are um, the main threats of birds for birds in Europe. And the results which we have obtained in this report are confirmed by, by, other, um, by other reports like the IPBS 2019 report or the state of nature in the EU report published in 2020. We also see that climate change is already showing its um, effect and it's very likely that we will exacerbate the negative impact of the big general threats that we observe. And while some threats are more easy to tackle, especially as they're more localized, uh, like for example, disturbance or poisoning of birds, and maybe sometimes um, simple, we know that it's not so simple, um, actions as protection of uh, birds from um, killing, for example, can show significant improvement in their populations. And this is one of the good examples that we have with the red kite, which you see on the picture, uh, where we observe impressive return of the population in Europe. One of these beautiful species recoveries that show us the conservation work. However, the big changes and the big threats that we see in our environment are systemic changes and systemic threats related to the unsustainable use of forests and marine resources, as well as unsustainable agricultural practices. And in order to return this, to turn these um, big systemic threats into less impact for the birds and help the biodiversity to recover, we need a change that is transformative, that starts from the way we source prime materials, the way we consume, the way we transport them and produce, the way we discard and recover the resources we use. Also, we need change that involves all stakeholders, from consumers to producers, landowners, and businesses. And when I'm saying this, I have in mind that all of us are consumers. Some of us are producers, some of us own land and also businesses. So we all have part to play. We also need a change that ensures the protection of ecosystems, which are still in good status, but also the restoration of degraded ones through adequate implementation, funding and resource. In order to protect nature for the generations to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Anna. Fantastic overview of the results. And just to say, there is an opportunity to ask questions after we've had all of the speeches, and you can start posting your questions in the bottom at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'm now going to introduce my colleague um, Ian Burfield, who is the Global Science Coordinator at BirdLife, and he is going to be sharing his views on the scientific implications of the results. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Martin. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll just share my screen. So I hope everybody can see that. Um, yeah, good morning. So well, I'd first like to start by um, by thanking Anna and, and Claire and everybody else involved in, in BirdLife Europe for their hard work in producing this, this great report. Um, it was a privilege to, to help you with it um, and great to see it launched today. Um, and Anna's already given a, a great overview of the implications for, for science and conservation at European level, what needs to happen next to, uh, to build off the results of this work and, and uh, help to set priorities for restoration and improve uh, the status of species. I just wanted to spend a few minutes today talking about some of the wider implications of this work, uh, both for BirdLife's own work um, and beyond. 
Um, so as you probably know, BirdLife International is the, the global red list authority for birds, which means um, that for, for the IUCN red list, we're responsible for uh, reassessing the uh, extinction risk of all the world's 11,000 or so bird species on a, on a regular basis and documenting that, um, putting the results on the, uh, the IUCN red list website for everybody to, to use in collaboration with, um, with IUCN. Um, for, we, we get the information that we need to do that from a wide variety of sources, of course, around the world. Um, but I think this is a really telling thing about the European Red List and, and one of the fantastic aspects of, of it is um, that it provides most of the information we need in one neat package every, every six years or so. Um, and that's also partly testament to the reporting process that was set up in the European Union uh, about a decade ago, which means that every, every six years, EU member states need to report on their progress with implementing the BIRDS Directive to the European Commission. Um, and that requires them to report on population sizes and trends of all the bird species in their country, along with the, the threats that are affecting them, the conservation actions that they're taking and which are needed. Um, and those are exactly the building blocks that we need to, um, when we combine the data for across those countries, uh, to then apply the IUCN Red List criteria and to classify these species according to their relative extinction risk. Um, so that's a, a great reporting system. Um, over the last few years, it's been extended more widely also. So countries that are, are signatories to the, uh, the African Eurasian Migratory Waterbird Agreement, AWA, uh, are also now required to report on, on their species covered by that agreement in a similar way. And also the Bern Convention, so that the Pan-European Convention on the Conservation of Habitats and Wildlife has also been trialing uh, uh, a similar reporting system for a subset of species. So hopefully in the future, we'll see this type of regular reporting by member states and countries and signatories uh, spreading even more widely. And that will deliver this regular flow of monitoring data and information that is absolutely essential for producing these types of assessments um, uh, and extinction risk uh, analyses. Um, we've been very fortunate in this round as well. So maybe 10 months ago, we saw the launch of another uh, incredibly important product by our, our colleagues and collaborators at the European Bird Census Council. So the, the second European Breeding Bird Atlas was, was published. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, and this also helps us because to apply some of the redness criteria, we also need to know the size of species ranges and how they're configured and what the change in the, the range, the spatial distribution of bird species has been over time. And that's exactly what this atlas gives us compared to their distribution in the first atlas from, from the 1980s. So from a very simplistic point of view, the, the, uh, the uh, equation there, so with, together with ERLOB and the, the new European atlas, these are really like gold dust for those of us who are responsible uh, for assessing the global red list status of species. And we'll be using them a lot over the coming year or so to reassess the global status of European species. So in terms of updating the global red list for, for these species, around about 100 European species, so about one fifth of the total are either endemic to Europe, so they're entirely confined to its borders or nearly endemic, so they may just creep into North Africa or, or the Middle East or just over the Urals in Russia, for example, but they're pretty much endemic to Europe. And for those, of course, it's very important that the, the regional extinction risk as being assessed through this project uh, matches or is the same as the global extinction risk. So with that in mind, as this project has uh, gone on over the last couple of years, we've uh, paid particular attention to those endemics and near endemic species, reviewed their status using the new data, and where we've seen that the new information means that their global status or category may need to change, we've proactively um, processed some of those through our, our normal global process. So we have a, a publicly accessible web forum where proposed category changes or requests for information are posted, expert consultation, um, and then we can solicit views on that, get new information, make decisions, and then put them into the global red list. Uh, and with that, we've done that over several rounds since the uh, of data became available. Uh, and as a result of that, well, Anna's already mentioned uh, one or two of these changes. So last year, we were very pleased to be able to downlist red kites back to least concern, uh, thanks to the recovery uh, conservation led by reintroductions and other measures across large parts of Europe, which was fantastic. Um, uh, and this year also in a couple of months time when the 2021 global red list update is released by IUCN and published on the BirdLife website as well, 
uh, would also be celebrating the downlisting of Razor Bill back from uh, near threat to least concern. So those are very good news stories, and obviously that's what we're all aiming for. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there have been species moving in the other direction. So uh, last year we uplisted a few species, including red leg partridge and old one's gull, largely due to um, declines in, in Iberia. They're both concentrated in Iberia, Southwest Europe. Um, and declines there are cause for concern. So that's now been elevated and acknowledged on the global red list for these species. Um, aside from the endemics and near endemics, of course, there are still more than 400 species, uh, which are slightly more widespread um, and which we need to reassess globally in the coming year. Uh, and of course, for those, we need to gather information from other parts of their range and see whether the trends that we're getting signals of from within Europe are similar or, or different outside, for example, in Central Asia or elsewhere in Africa, North America sometimes even, uh, and then work out the overall global trend. Uh, but just to give you a few hints here of species that we, we have on our radar, which um, unfortunately, in the case of the first few species, may need to be uplisted, so move to a higher threat category on the global red list. Um, there are several waders emerging from, uh, from the new European red list. Um, I've uh, shown here the cover of an existing multi-species action plan for, for waders uh, in, in Europe. Um, and about half those species on the front cover are already of global concern, near threatened in most cases. So the, the curly, black-tailed gobwit, lapwing, oyster catcher. Um, but it does look increasingly like some of the other species, uh, which are currently least concerned globally, may need to be uplisted to a higher global category uh, on the, the, um, the strength of these results. So just emphasizing, again, the crucial importance of implementing this action plan over the coming decade for, for those and other wader species in particular. Demoiselle crane has also been mentioned by Anna as a species whose European population is really in a worrying condition now. So depending what's going on in its, in its Asian uh, flyway populations as well, which we need to investigate, that may also need to be uplisted from least concern. And redneck nightjar, another Iberian species, but which also breeds in Northwest Africa. There are worrying signs of decline from, uh, from Spain. So we need to work out what's going on in West Africa and that may need to be uplisted as well. On a more positive note, um, some of the species which have been the focus of conservation action over the last 20 or 30 years or more, um, so some iconic uh, water birds, for example, marble teal, uh, white-headed duck, um, do show signs of uh, increasing. Sometimes this is due to better knowledge, but sometimes due to genuine increases as well. So again, we need to complete the wider picture, but we're hopeful that maybe one or more of these um, may be uh, move to a lower global threat category in the coming year. And um, pallid harrier and also several other Central Asian species, there are, there are signs from, from Europe that they may be spreading, doing a bit better perhaps. So again, if we can get more information from their core range in Central Asia and elsewhere, uh, we can see whether that holds true and possibly downlist those as well. So just a taste of some of the changes we may see in the next few months. The second aspect I'd just like to focus on briefly um, is about the red list index. So. Uh, this is a, a metric of overall of biodiversity change, which was developed about 15 years ago. Um, and since that time, it's gained a lot of traction in uh, international policy processes. So it's, it's used as a, a high level indicator um, of, of how we're doing to uh, avert the biodiversity crisis, both under the, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, for example, was one of the indicators used to measure whether the, the AG targets for 2020 um, for reducing the number of threatened species or the overall extinction risk uh, was achieved. Uh, and also under the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it has a lot of traction there, as well as various other policy processes. So this involves using the Red List information that we get from repeated assessments of the same sets of species uh, in repeated assessments, putting those in baskets and looking at how uh, the the, the overall extinction risk of different baskets of species has changed over time. Uh, we only factor in here genuine changes, so things that are due to better knowledge or perhaps taxonomic rearrangements, those are, those are removed, they don't influence the Red List Index, so it's only real change, whether for better or for worse, that is reflected here. Um, so if uh, you can see the, a number of graphs here on the, on the slide, uh, these were taken from our, our 2018 State of the World's Birds report for different focal groups of interest. So on all these graphs, if, if all the species in your group of interest were of least concern, then the value would be one, you'd have a straight line across the top. Uh, whereas if they were all gone extinct, you'd have a, 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 a point at zero at the bottom. And as you can see, a number of these groups of species have declined. The, the blue lines on those graphs show the, uh, the trends for those groups in the red list index, whereas the red line shows the overall global trend. Um, so old world vultures, particularly in, in uh, Asia and Africa, we know are in, are in deep crisis, and you can see that reflected in the, in the red list index there, showing their overall movement towards extinction. 
And of course, the new data from the European Red List will be fed into improving and updating these Red List index values um, so that we have a, a new data point next year. But as well as the global red list index, we can also produce sub-global or regional red list in indices, um, such as those from the European red list index here. Uh, so in the past, uh, based on the first two assessments that Anna has described earlier, we produced such an, uh, an index um, using those data. Um, we're now in a position where we should be able to update these regional red list indices, both at EU and pan-European levels using the new results, and then disaggregate them by uh, different groups, so whether we whether by habitat um, or family, but also potentially by policy relevant subsets such as the birds directive, Annex 1 or Annex 2 species. And this gives us another really useful measure of how we're doing to reduce or uh, avert the extinction of those subsets of species. So this is another way in which the new uh, European Red List data will be extremely useful. And the, the third and final area of or implication I wanted to touch on briefly was just thinking a bit beyond extinction risk. Um, we spend a lot of time because it's our core responsibility um, assessing the global extinction risk of species for the Red for 11,000 species. That is a, a full time job for, for the team in, in Cambridge. Um, so just knowing whether something working out, whether it's threatened or near threatened or least concern is, involves a huge amount of work, as you can imagine. At European level, we're fortunate because we have this rich source of data that's regularly updated uh, with lots of detail. We can go beyond that, and we, as well as saying, well, as well as the species that are threatened and near threatened, which are, are crucial, as, as Anna's explained, we can also subdivide the least concerned species into different subcategories and work out whether they're declining or depleted or rare or localized, or whether we can confidently say that they are, in fact, secure. Uh, and we've done this over the last 30 years in the repeated assessments that Anna mentioned earlier. Uh, and this also speaks to quite a lot of the policy mechanisms. So the Birds Directive, the Berne Convention, the uh, AWA, for example, they're not, they're not just interested about preventing extinction, they are concerned with uh, maintaining or restoring species to a, a favorable population status, um, which goes much deeper than just making sure things don't go extinct. So it's really important and useful that we can do this. Um, and as Anna said, 13% of European bird species are considered regionally threatened in this new assessment. That's very similar to the uh, percentage of all birds globally um, and how threatened they are. But based on the first three assessments we've done uh, since 1994, uh, applying those more detailed uh, spec criteria that I showed on the previous slide, we found that three times that number of species are in fact not in what we would consider to be a, a good or acceptable or favorable population status. Um, so in other words, there are lots more species um, below the tip of the iceberg that need conservation attention. Um, and knowing what these are helps us to um, uh, assign national responsibilities because with the ERLOB data, we know the percentage of the European populations occurring in each country. We can therefore um, uh, add value to the results coming from the red list by saying, okay, if for each country, these are the threatened and near threatened and, and species, other species of concern that they hold, these are their responsibilities in terms of the percentage of the European population that they are responsible for. And this can help to inform and uh, restoration uh, priorities um, and allocation of resources in different countries in order to help make the, the overall goal of restoring nature more tractable um, over the coming years during this decade of restoration. Uh, so we'll be in the coming year or so adding value, doing further analyses with these new European Red List data with, with Anna and Claire and the team, um, and hopefully publishing more um, analysis like this. So uh, look out for those in the coming year. And uh, yeah, just well done again to all the team behind this, uh, this great new work. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, fantastic to hear the wider significance of today's report. Um, and for those of you who joined a little bit late to this session, just to say that it is possible for you to ask questions um, by posting them on the Q&A function, which is at the centre at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm now going to um, hand over to uh, um, Mikael O'Brien, who's the Deputy Head of the Nature Unit in DG Environment uh, for the European Commission. Uh, as you heard earlier, European Commission to help fund this work, and Mikael's a great friend of bird life and nature, and uh, it's fantastic to welcome you to this event today. Over to you, Mikael. Thank you, Martin, and good morning, dear colleagues. It's, it's a privilege to be able to join you for this special event, and a big congratulations to BirdLife for uh, this work. 
it is a very significant uh, piece of work that BirdLife have now published today. It is hugely relevant to the biodiversity agenda in the European Union, and I would argue in Europe and globally. So it sets a benchmark for the debates that are taking place currently in relation to our ambitions and targets for biodiversity for the coming decade. We don't make progress unless we have good science to underpin our policies. Last year, we in the European Union published the most up-to-date state of nature assessment covering both the birds directive and the habitats directives. And that was fed by the red data list assessment that BirdLife had done for 28 countries. The 27 member states and the United Kingdom uh, were party to that assessment. And that health check was a critical base in which we moved forward in terms of setting our EU biodiversity policy. Now we have a wider exercise covering over 50 countries. And I think that gives us a broader perspective in relation to our action that we need to take across the European continent. Um, it, it really is a, a huge piece of work that uh, informs our policies in relation to how in the European Union, we will work on implementation of our legislation. The BIRDS Directive is the most important tool, but it is equally relevant in the context of the work that needs to be done and achieved in the Bern Convention, in the Convention on Migratory Species, and also the AWA, the African Eurasian Waterbird Agreement, which are critical in terms of cooperation between countries across our continent. What of course is disturbing, particularly given that we have this legislation in place for many decades, is that we are continuing to lose nature in Europe. This assessment makes it very clear that despite the successes that we're having, and they do exist, that the overall trend is one of continued erosion of nature. So if we're going to be serious about halting the decline and achieving recovery, we really need to step up and have a more ambitious agenda for the coming decade. Martin alluded to the debate that has taken place in recent days in Kunming in China, and that will continue into next year in relation to the global agenda under the Convention on Biological Diversity, where we really need to see an ambitious, uh, agenda with real targets and enabling mechanisms to deliver change. In the European Union, we, we believe that good practice starts at home. So before going to Kunming, and the EU is very committed to an ambitious outcome to the CBD debate, we issued a EU biodiversity strategy covering the next decade. And this red data list assessment and the state of nature assessment was a fundamental underpinning in terms of seeing where we are and setting out an agenda for where we need to, to go. And there are a number of policy initiatives in that uh, strategy, which I think are directly informed and for which the red data list assessment and the continuing work of BirdLife and others is fundamental. And if I could just name a few of those policy areas where we need to focus on in the coming decade. Central to any biodiversity strategy is ensuring that we have sufficient space, high quality space for nature. So the role of protected areas is fundamental, both in the global debate and in the European debate. And in the EU strategy, we have set out an increased ambition for 30% of land and sea to be under legal protection, and that one third of this would be strictly protected. Now, that's very ambitious. We've been working for many decades on the Natura 2000 network, which covers about 20% of land and 10% of marine. There's still some significant distance to go in relation to the marine environment, even under Natura. But we need to step up and ensure that 
further protected areas, including for species that have been identified of particular concern under this red data list that they are achieved. And we're not interested in paper parks. These areas need to be effectively managed. And today we still work to achieve clearly defined conservation measures based on conservation objectives that are clear for each of the Natura 2000 sites. And that needs to be extended for the coming, uh, the broader uh, protected area agenda. We also have a focus not only on halting the decline, no further deterioration of protected species and habitats, but we have set an ambitious goal that there should be a 30% of those habitats and species which are showing measurable recovery improvements, either that they have reached favorable status or that they are showing such improvements that they are in that direction. Now, we already have launched that debate, but of course the work that is done in this red data list provides a strategic basis for measuring that and obviously for identifying some of the critical areas that we need to have particular focus on. Of course, that will require more than simply listing species. It requires conservation science, understanding the management needs of the species. So we really hope that bird life continues to engage in this process so that when we sit down with member states and ask them what their strategic priorities are, that we have the conservation science that bird life and others, we have that very much in the debate. Martin mentioned that this is the UN a decade on ecosystem restoration to heal our planet. And the EU in the context of its biodiversity strategy is going to have a particular focus on recovery, on restoration. And in this context, we're coming forward, hopefully later this year, with a proposal from the European Commission for a new legislative instrument on nature restoration that will give impetus to this agenda for the coming decade. And of course, this has to be linked to climate objectives, to actually the benefits in terms of recovery of ecosystems. And hopefully this will contain a species recovery target, which will be informed by this red data list and by other red data lists that we have supported over uh, the past decades. Of course, all of this requires investment, both in terms of finance, but also in terms of human capital, because we need in the administrations and in the NGO sector to have the support so that the people can do the work. And of course, there is a debate taking place within the EU as to how the EU funds can actually be worked in a way that deliver these public goods. And um, the Life Fund is a very important strategic fund that has delivered real benefits for bird conservation over the past decade. Some of the success stories like the bittern, like the Azores bullfinch have actually benefited from life funds that has been targeted to allow the capacity for conservation action at a sufficient scale. And we have updated recently the list of priority birds which get extra additional support in relation to the co-financing rate under the life program. And this has been informed by the red data list process. So you can see the direct link between the knowledge, the conservation science and the policy focus. Of course, there is a much wider debate in terms of how, particularly in relation to agriculture, how we ensure that the policy is supportive in relation to the recovery of species because farmland birds, um, as Anna has shown, are one of the critical groups in relation to the decline in Europe. And therefore the challenge in the coming period will be to make sure that the agri-environment programs are really delivering benefits and that the other elements of the pillar, of the first pillar of the common agriculture policy, including the eco schemes are really designed in ways that deliver benefits that also we can actually work in ways that farmers will engage in, in this process. And that's a really big challenge, and it's an ongoing debate. Of course, we need to focus also on the continued implementation of our core legislation, 
in the EU, the birds directive, but also to support the work that is done in a pan-European context under the Bern Convention and in a broader flyway context under CMS and under AWA. We've launched a reflection, for example, in relation to, based on the state of nature assessment, in relation to the concerns that exist in relation to species that are huntable under the birds directive. And we really need to ensure that as we move forward, that any hunting of these species that are showing serious declines are, is sustainable. Hunting may not be responsible for the declines, but the question really is, can you sustain hunting in the context of the big pressures that these species are under? So that debate has started in the context of the discussions within the EU, and it really is important that we work with the hunters, work with bird life and other conservation bodies to make sure that this is a structured debate. We've already done so in the context of the turtle dove, where bird life and others have produced an international species action plan. And we have built on that with a group of experts from Spain and France in particular to produce an adaptive harvest management mechanism, which allows a clear determination as to whether hunting should take place for the different flyways of this species. Now, as colleagues have mentioned, we have our nature biodiversity agenda, but there is a much broader agenda which we need to engage with in the context of ensuring success over the coming decade. Particularly in terms of linking to the climate agenda, both mitigation and adaptation. In the European Union, we have the Green Deal, which sets out this much broader agenda to ensure that we transform our society to make it much more sustainable. That is not only a climate agenda, but it is one in which we are trying to promote the circular economy, that our whole patterns of consumption and production are transformed in ways that will ensure sustainability. Because we in Europe cannot continue to live. Um, the planet is not big enough in relation to sustaining the impact that we are causing. So there is a great deal to do. There is a really ambitious agenda for the coming decade. Um, I think that today there is a much greater recognition of the biodiversity crisis than ever before. It's not only a debate about climate. We know that climate and biodiversity go hand in hand and that the recovery of nature is central to the success and viability of our species in the coming decade. We have carried out Eurobarometer surveys in Europe, which show that there is an expectation and a desire among European citizens that we actually succeed in making progress towards the recovery of nature. So thanks again to BirdLife. And um, this work is hugely significant and the volunteers that have contributed to it really deserve a special thanks today. Thank you, Martin. Mikael, that's absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for outlining uh, the EU biodiversity strategy, in particular how um, the EU is really rising to this challenge. Um, thank you so much. And we'll see you in a moment because after our final speaker, we're going to have a QA. Um, uh, as you can see, there is a chat, um, the QA function at the bottom of the screen. Please post your questions there. I should also say that the red list itself is now available on the BirdLife Europe website. So you can just um, Google that and find it there. Um, but our final speaker today is um, Sylvia Ursel, who's from the Society for the Protection of Birds and Nature in Moldova. So going slightly beyond the EU now, and Sylvia is going to give a perspective from the grassroots and also to explain how it's going to be relevant to a national context. Over to you, Sylvia. Hi, Martin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a really uh, big pleasure for me to join you today. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I would like to share my screen and to, uh, to dive into challenges of uh, bird monitoring and data collection from a small Eastern European country, which you probably heard of. Uh, my name is Silvia Ursul, and uh, I um, represent um, the Society for Birds and Nature Protection, which is a fairly new, young NGO emerging in the, uh, in the field of ornithology in the Republic of Moldova. 
which is, as you might know, sorry, just a second, quite small country, both in terms of population and surface, uh, sandwiched between uh, Ukraine and Romania. It's a fairly agrarian country with the different types of um, uh, habitats and landscapes. And luckily for us, um, luckily for us, it's, uh, we don't have any extensive farming in terms of huge sur surfaces. All we have are just small plots which create uh, an effect of mosaic. Uh, and I think this is beneficial for many bird species. Uh, but on the other hand, we face here with a number of challenges that probably were familiar to you in different situations or in different stages of your professional development. Um, it's true, we all know that there are very few ornithologists in Eastern European countries and extremely few young specialists. Uh, this turns to, this leads to poor development of ornithological research and therefore Moldova is quite absent from international scientific papers. And uh, to, to, make, uh, to make matters even worse, uh, the general public is also not that interested when it comes to challenges that wildlife is facing right now, uh, problems, uh, so social, economic, or political problems, they do take all our attention. Um, and in this, um, you know, perfect storm, yeah, in these heavy, difficult conditions, um, our organization is emerging as a group and a learning environment for many people, both ornithologists, but also simple bird watchers to focus to focus heavily on the study of uh, wild birds because we believe this is the first thing to do the first step towards uh, protection towards conservation uh, and towards uh, focused um, strategies and plans for the future uh, this is why uh, a good part of our activity is focused on field studies to uh, fill in the knowledge gap that exists right now. And we were lucky to contribute to um, the European Red, Red List of Birds uh, using a variety of um, field work data. But unfortunately, the sources are so few, I can count them on my hands, on, on the fingers of my hand, because it's um, it's a fairly new emerging, we have very few emerging common uh, bird monitoring schemes. Uh, some of them happened in the past, some of them are still ongoing. I will not read them all, but uh, a good part of our work also relies on using opportunistic data that people put on your bird. But the most important, by far, the most important for us project in which we contributed the, in the recent years was the, the field work for making the second European breeding bird that was happening. We were very honored and pleased to receive a, a financial support that we used for a lot of field work, intensive and extensive field work to just learn and see what is in the field, just to scan the country. And what you see here is our country in terms of uh, 50 per 50 squares, which you all know was the, you know, was the unit used by uh, all the countries. Uh, and to reach a better coverage, we decided to, 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 to split this uh, 50 per 50 squares in 10 per 10 squares that will allow us for to more in-depth study and as a result we managed to gather data regarding almost 100 uh, uh, breeding birds breeding species from 188 uh, squares, 10% squares, which of course may not seem too much, uh, you know, comparing to other countries, especially Western countries. But for us, for our small team of 15 people, was a big success and um, was, you know, motivating to continue further with our studies in the future. So this year, uh, we had our second attempt to establish a common birds monitoring program, which I know is, um, is um, already a traditional program in many Western countries. 
but here was, I don't know why, but it was quite difficult. So this year we managed to, uh, you know, to create these two per two kilometer parcels and only six field workers uh, volunteered to, uh, to take over uh, this work. And uh, of course, it's a really, really, really small step, but still I'm proud of that and I'm happy to, you know, to, uh, take from these field workers important data regarding 50 species of birds that currently are using our habitats. Um, we had in the past uh, three years ago a citizen science attempt, again, the type of program that already exists in many other countries um, regarding the distribution of uh, of uh, white stork. Uh, for us, it was again, it was, you know, zero knowledge about that, zero information. So we, um, we went ahead and we asked the public to help us to put on the map uh, what, what nests they see. And as a result, this is the map with 40, sorry, for 440 nests, which again, might not seem, might not seem too much, but uh, we are happy to have uh, accurate data in terms of type of support, because as you know, uh, in many European countries, we noticed a decline on, su on support such as trees uh, and instead a growing number of, of pillars. Uh, and it's really important for us to uh, keep track of all the changes that this species is, um, is facing because it's one of the more visible, it's one of the more known and, and charismatic species in Moldova. After this, after the citizen science attempt, we had uh, also two others, uh, this type of censuses, when we ask people to put on the map whatever uh, nests they see of uh, barn swallow uh, and house martin. And also we ask them to let us know uh, where and when they, they noticed any uh, I saw this uh, root, roosts, but unfortunately, these attempts were not that successful. And I think part of that is that these birds are simply not known towards the general public as um, as the white stork. So for me, this is a lesson that we should raise more awareness and continue nonstop talking to people about birds, about simple species that they have around them. Um, thanks to all this. Um, monitoring schemes, thanks to all this data that we gather from as many research, as many sources as we can, as we can afford right now, we managed to uh, register important progress, I would say, in um, getting more data and getting better knowledge about the distribution of several important uh, species for us, such as, for example, the sacred falcon, which you all, you, you all know is an endangered species, but we are lucky to have a small population in Moldova. We also managed to document the distribution of Liban Sparrowhawk, of uh, Great Great Shrike that is currently expanding in our country uh, for the wintering season, or the Paso Hispaniolensis that currently is expanding from, from the south um, to the country up to the north and so many other species which which i uh, which i don't have time today unfortunately to talk about them but um, their situation and data about their status can be found in this new brand new red list of birds and of course all this could not be possible without constant field work sometimes uh supported financially supported by ourselves because we don't have anyone else to support our our um you know efforts and of course, it might happen a lot of time in Moldova, it happens to have a lot of incidents and unpleasant situations that instead that in the future will turn into nice memories. So I thank you for your attention and uh, I hope I could, uh, I, I can answer all your questions. Sylvia, thank you so much for uh, giving an overview from Moldova and wonderful to see the new emergence of a birding and nature conservation community in Moldova. Absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, so we're now going to have our panel session of Q&A. Um, 
those of you who have been here since the beginning will know that you can post your questions on the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, and you can also vote for the questions uh, that you like and you want to be asked, and they will then be uplisted. So if I could ask uh, Mikael, Sylvia, uh, Ian and Anna to turn on their uh, videos, that's great. Uh, and um, I'm going to try and, try and get through as many as I can um, as quickly as possible. Um, the first question, perhaps surprise, surprise, is around the common agricultural policy. And Martin Helikar has asked that this is this is clearly critical, um, but it's failing to support sustainability and conservation, both at, um, uh, at commission level and at member state level. And um, Martin's alluding to the proposals that just emerged from Cyprus. And his rather bold, big question is, how can we change this? Michaela, I, can I quickly put this, to, this first one to you? Because obviously you mentioned the need for agricultural reform. I just wonder if you want to give a perspective from the commission. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one because obviously the cap is hugely significant. Um, farmland birds really need help. And I know that BirdLife would, would like to have seen a stronger regulatory framework that would drive that change. I, I would argue that um, there are really uh, many opportunities under the Common Agriculture Policy, the new cycle, both under the first pillar and under the second pillar. Um, in relation to eco schemes, in relation to different provisions um, that need to be really seized. We've tried to support uh, this uh, planning up front to define nature needs, funding needs and priorities. Each of the countries have been asked to set out that strategically, including for agricultural ecosystems uh, through what we call prioritized action frameworks. So Cyprus, all the member states have actually uh, been asked to provide this. We use these as references to define and check when these plans are coming in, and they're coming in at the moment from the member states to see to what extent there is a correspondence between that. Um, we also have set up a contract to look at farmland, bird conservation, to help design better schemes, because it really is fundamental that we have the conservation science informing the design of schemes at an appropriate scale. And um, I think that's something that we need to build on and hopefully BirdLife and others will, will be party to that debate. Um, another thing that really is important, and I think this is something is through those initiatives, we need to have a better engagement of farmers because we talk about farmers in one homogenous group, but there are many good things happening through uh, farming that we need to build on, including result-based payment schemes that are designed and developed. And also the farm advisory services. There are opportunities under this new policy cycle to strengthen and improve the farm advisory services so that we get actually outcomes. And of course, the knowledge base, I mean, the farmland bird index that EBCC um, has developed is one of the fundamental um, sets of reference in terms of measuring progress on our policy. So that just to give you an indication that we are following this matter closely. I'm not saying there's an easy fix. There's many competing objectives, and but uh, there is certainly a greater, sh sharper focus on the need to transform our agriculture policy into one that delivers for nature as well as providing uh, food. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, and I think we could have a whole webinar on the future of the CAP, um, which unfortunately we won't have time for today. But just to say, I think it's been fantastic to see different voices like Fridays of the Future come in to call for radical reform of the CAP. And that's happened this time, not just because of the impacts on nature, but also on climate. And I should say, if you look west from where you're sitting now, you'll see an interesting experiment where obviously in England, they're looking to ensure all public money goes towards um, public goods and Hopefully we'll see some real recovery of farmland and birds um, and there. Um, okay, the next question um, is, actually we've got a bundle around um, uh, waders and water birds actually. Um, the first one is coming from Michelle Sorrentini, uh, wanting to understand um, how the, um, the uh, sort of wetlands and national results were taken into account in assessing the red list categories and trends. Uh, so she's pointed out that Shoveler shows increasing trends in winter population until 2018 all over Europe was described declining in the red list. Uh, and I'm going to ask Anna to answer this one. Um, Anna. 
Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Michele, for the question. Uh, yes, indeed, we uh, have uh, considered the data from the International Water Census, um, Water Birth Census, uh, for our assessment were relevant. Um, overall, we have uh, assessed species during the breeding and, um, and or uh, wintering season, uh, but we have chosen for the final assessment the season in which the species is more uh, threatened or has uh, is in higher risk, in risk of extinction. And uh, therefore, uh, specifically for the shoulder, we have assessed the species um, uh, during the breeding season as a final assessment. So you that, that may be one of the reasons you see difference between the uh, IWC data and our results. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. The next one is from Arthur Schutz, who asks, please explain why quite a few species with decreasing trends did not get a high extinction risk category or even got downgraded. I'm going to pass that one over to Ian. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Martin. And thanks for the question. Uh, so one simple reason for this is that under the IUCN red list criteria, for example, to be um, listed as uh, vulnerable under criterion A, which is about population size reduction, the species needs to be declining by more than 30% over 10 years or, or three generation lengths. Um, and so there are lots of species in Europe which are declining or decreasing at slower rates than that or uh, over a longer period of time, uh, but which unfortunately did not come close enough to either qualify as near threatened or vulnerable on the red list on that basis. Um, however, we do recognize that this means that lots of decreasing species um, are not flagged up by a strict red list uh, application process. And that's one of the reasons why we uh, have developed the additional spec criteria that I outlined to pick up other species which are declining at slower rates or perhaps which have decreased in the past by a lot and still need to recover to their former levels so we don't lose uh, sight of them completely. Uh, thanks Ian. Um, next one is regarding the drastic decline in water birds due to micro... No, the question here is from Carol Neal. Um, why are water birds declining? Is that because of microplastics and spray? Um, what do we know? Um, I'm going to start with Anna on that one. Do you have any view on the reasons why we're seeing the water bird declines? Uh, thank you, Martin. Well, uh, one of the main reasons is the because uh, wetlands or their main habitat are highly threatened and one of the most threatened habitat actually and uh, we are losing wetlands across the world and uh, in the past decades we have lost around 70 percent of them globally and uh, water pollution is probably uh, one of the main reasons uh, but also disturbance and um, infrastructure around those wetlands. Uh, we may have some uh, evidence in terms of uh, microplastics, but as far as I know, um, maybe Ian can add here, um, we don't have enough yet to, to tell how much impact um, this threat has on water birds. I mean, clearly loss of habitat is a big, big, big deal. Uh, and and uh, Ian, do you want to add anything on this one? Um, no, not much to add to what Anna's said really on this one at the moment. Um, so more research needed, but uh, no, I think, and I think looking at the results for some of the species in detail on in the report when it's published and the underlying species fact sheets will help to you know, throw more light on what's driving the declines of different species. So that's what I would say, I guess. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, next one from Claudio um, Salado. I apologize if I get your names wrong. Um, it's sort of a plea to have a clearer calendar for the next few years in order to coordinate reporting for the birth directive, spec update, next red list and even IBA's update and um, how can we um, help people provide information in an efficient way. In some ways I see it as a gauntlet to all of us to do that coordination but um, does anyone have a, an observation on that or just say yes we'll try and do better. Um, I'm looking to see if any of you want to actually answer that one. Um, I think we'll just do better on that. Um, Claudia, we'll do our, we'll, we will do our best. Um, so uh, the next one is from Luis um, Gordino. Um, uh, Anna mentioned only birds breeding and wintering in Europe were evaluated. And in fact, birds like um, it, um, Ardena Garicia are missing from the list. Wouldn't it be interesting to evaluate common migrants as well, even if they don't breed or winter in Europe? Any thoughts on that one? Um, I'll go to Anna first and Ian, you might have a, a rule for the red listing, which <laughs> determines whether we do that or not. Anna? 
Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, um, our data on migratory birds is quite patchy, to be honest, compared to the data we have on breeding and wintering birds. So this makes it difficult to, to use these data sometimes. Uh, for species where we do have a better quality uh, migratory data, we do consider it uh, in our assessments, but our methodology is mainly based on, on uh, the breeding or the wintering uh, season. Um, that helps. Yeah, that, that's that's great. I'm just going to pause briefly and bring in Sylvia for a separate question. Um, you, you talked about the sort of the growth in um, the birding community within Moldova. What do you think are the sort of big challenges you're going to have to overcome over the next few years to sort of improve monitoring, reporting and understanding of bird populations in Moldova? Um, thank you. That's a great question. I think uh, an um, reoccurring, always emerging problem is related to the economical status of our country, which makes us lose people to migration uh, every year. And I've witnessed it since my since the beginning of my activity as a young ornithologist here. I witnessed many of my colleagues, many of my fellows, just choosing different careers abroad. And I'm afraid that this might happen in the next future when our community, our bird watchers and ornithological community will shrink. Uh, and this is partly due to, as I said, economical uh, challenges and um, sometimes lack of critical financial support for doing uh, intensive field work in order to keep up with the changes that are happening in the background. Great. Well, we're, we're within the bird life community, we're here to help and wanting to ensure we have flourishing birding communities all around the world. Um, I think we're moving on to Ida's um, next. Uh, another question from Luis uh, was talking about the decline of Ida's um, and wondered whether it was linked to the decline in fish stocks um, because he was under the impression that they fed mainly on mollusks, echinoderms, uh, and is this because fish eggs are important to their diet? And, and a cheers and keep up the good work at the end there. So um, specific question on Ida's, and then I'm going to link this one actually um, to a, a, a seabird question, which I'm going to ask and compose at Miguel. But, um, but um, Anna, any comment on the Ida challenge? Uh, we um, have, uh, if I remember well, um, one, two research has um, used um, for, this information, uh, and we probably can follow up on this question um, later uh, with the details. Um, the problem we have um, a, a mentioned here um, is uh, local uh, and, and affects part of the population, but actually uh, the, the source that we refer is the Icelandic Red Data Book, if that helps. Yeah. Ian, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much you know about Ida declines. Have you got anything to add here as to the, the causes? Uh, no, not beyond really what Anna's. I mean, this is another species where we need to now take on board the results of the new European assessment and see what yeah. it means at global level to potentially reassess that species status. But it's obviously already uh, paid off with uh, investment and in action plan and lots of lots more conservation attention in the last decade since it was uplisted. Um, so there's more research going on, more monitoring, which yeah. is which is great. I mean, as I said right on the introduction, the key thing is that monitoring helps us identify the problems. And then obviously we need to go and do the diagnostic research to understand the reasons for decline and then put in place the right measures. Um, and in relation to that, I'm going to ask um, Mikhail actually a question about the decline in seabirds and I suppose the opportunities for reforming a fisheries policy and whether if you have any comments on that. Um, Mikhail, sorry to give you both CAP and CFP, but uh, any thoughts on CFP? Could I, could I just maybe pick up on one or two points leading into that question while I think about the answer of that question? Yeah, of um, firstly, there are still knowledge gaps. And um, we, 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 from the birds directive point of view, it's quite incredible that we have a piece of legislation over 40 years old and we still have gaps in, uh, in knowledge. And I think we will be focusing on, on not only recovery, but also addressing those knowledge gaps. So there is a, an issue of compliance with legislation. And I think that's important in bird life should be aware of that in terms of the debate that we need in the coming years. On the Eider duck, there is a debate in the AWA um, in the context of an international plan 
and an adaptive harvest management mechanism, particularly for the Baltic population. And we're party to that uh, because it's mainly EU countries involved in relation to ensuring the sustainability of any harvest. There are also challenges in relation to predation. Sometimes you get competition like recovery of white-tailed eagles and um, having impacts on maybe birds nesting in certain areas. So and there is, there is a debate taking place, but hopefully the bird life work will, will inform. Now, of course, in relation to the, the marine environment and seabirds, um, uh, in terms, I mean, one of the big challenges in terms of the fisheries policy is to put in place management measures for the protected areas. I mean, we, we still today have uh, paper parks for largely for the marine environment, including for special protection areas. Um, and what we need to do is to translate that into real fisheries management measures the, the legislation allows for it, but the mechanisms are not working well enough in relation to, that's a fundamental in relation to that. And of course, in terms of issues of bycatch, um, there has been a seabird action plan in the EU. Um, it's questionable how effective that has been in relation to issues of bycatch. We need to look at that. So the more we have a diagnosis for different species through conservation science, in terms of what the real pressures and threats are, the more that we can actually talk about it. Now, in relation to reform of the fisheries policy, I'm not able to say today whether there is a plan. I think there is a reflection as to how it's working or not working. And I think that should trigger a debate as to where we should go. But there are some um, mechanisms that are there already that should be working and need to work. Thank you. I really agree with that, Mikhail. Um, I think our latest assessment was only 1% of European waters have active management plans as well as protected areas, so 10% coverage, so huge work to be done there, reducing bycatch and of course to try and um, get the sustainable deployment of offshore marine energy. So this is, a, I think, a, a big frontier of conservation challenge over the coming years. Um, I've got the next question from uh, Wenceslas. Uh, Wensi asks, great work, thank you BirdLife. A uh, question I think will be on many people's minds um, from the presentation Anna gave. The analysis classified data deficient as least concern. Would it not be better to keep the data deficient categories so that more research can be targeted at those? Uh, again, I have a feeling this might be a red list rule, but Anna, do you want to answer that one? Uh, yes, thank you, Wenceslas, for the question. Um, actually, we are at a relatively good place in Europe in terms of the data we have about birds. And um, uh, th this is why we actually do not apply the data deficient category um, in the case of European birds, because we actually always have some uh, level of information. Um, and even if uh, we are not able to tell what the trend is, um, and classi classify the species as um, least concern for the moment, uh, it is not really the case um, when we absolutely don't have information and we use the data deficient category. Thank you. Right, so there must be a threshold of information to allow you to get into that category. Yeah. Okay, really helpful. Okay, I'm going to try and be really rapid and get through these final ones. Um, uh, Gamzi asked whether Turkey is part of this data even if politically it doesn't be part of the EU. And um, so um, do you want to just offer a view on the, um, the coverage for Turkey, Anna? Yes, uh, sure. Turkey is part of this assessment um, and uh, as important part of European continent and uh, as well as it is uh, the Caucasus region and the European part of Russia, as I mentioned on the East. Uh, great. Um, I think there was a general question about what about those species who have the tip of their range in Europe uh, and being evaluated as threatened uh, and wondering um, mm -hmm. the value of those results. Can I pass that on to Ian? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so this is a good question and gives us a chance to explain a bit about the, the regional application of the IUCN criteria and, and guidelines. Um, their, I used to develop this about 10, 15 years ago. And precisely for this reason, when you look at sub-global level, whatever you're looking at a country or a region or whatever it may be, there are always going to be marginal species that cause you issues. Um, but they've developed a system whereby, um, well, some people either exclude marginal species from such assessments. So if, if for example, less than 5% of their global range falls within the region of assessment, 
some assessments just ignore them. We don't do that because we always prefer to include all naturally and regularly occurring wild species, however small their population. But what we can do under the, the regional application guidelines is to um, downgrade their regional threat assessment by one or two categories, um, accord, note which uh, takes into account it reflects the fact that they're part of a larger non-European population which can supply rescue effects, particularly if those species are, are migrants. Um, so if they were to go regionally extinct in their marginal European population, it's quite likely they could be uh, repopulated from outside. Obviously, we don't do that. If the European population is declining, even if it's marginal, we don't down, downgrade them because it's clear that that um, rescue effect is not operating and therefore it would be, uh, be wrong to do that. But that's how we, we can moderate down the marginal status so that they don't have too big an effect on the overall list of regionally threatened species. But thanks for the question. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, we're, we're drawing to a close. I will try and finish off the last the last few questions that have come in. Um, one of them is really an observation from Jose Maria saying, um, congratulations everyone for, for the work. Um, surprised that Water Brothers are doing comparatively badly because they're among the first groups to gain attention from the conservation in the 70s. Uh, and, and, you know, it's of course right, the Ramsar Convention, you know, early 1970s led to wetland um, conservation. But I think it's, it's clear as with the other really important groups like seabirds and um, farm and birds that while we've known about these challenges for a long time even though we have done some great things and I think Mikael described that earlier there's just not been um, sufficient and adequate um, and that's why I think we're all saying everyone I think used the words we need to scale up our efforts over the coming months and years. Um, the, the, the final question I'm going to ask is, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to deal with Roger's question in my, my closing comment, but um, Luis has asked again in short, I deducted that the deduced that the um, status of the new European Red List of Birds was recalculated from data in the national reports um, from the Birds Directive rather than compiled summarised from national Red List. Is that correct, Anna? Yes, uh, thank you, Luis, for the question. Um, actually, um, yes, for, for the compilation of this report, uh, we use data from the Article uh, 12 of the Birds Directive reporting uh, by the EU member states, but from outside Europe, we have collected data from national um, experts and um, in, in a very similar format to the data reported by EU member states. But we also used uh, national uh, red lists when they, these were available to compare the results, but also to gather um, uh, relevant um, uh, country specific information about uh, those relevant parts of the population. So, um, yes, uh, we have used uh, the, the national red list um, and national red data books as uh, supplementary information to our assessment. Great. Um, I'm, I'm going to be uh, a bit naughty, and I'm, I'm going to sneak in this last question from Michael Grell, um, who really, and I might give this to Mikhail actually, um, the European Red List of Threatened Species and the EU Nature Directive seem to be parallel conservation systems that are not well synchronised um, for member state, the obligations of conservation all according to the EU directives. This means there is a risk that some red list threatened species are not addressed for conservation action on a member state level. How do we better integrate red lists um, uh, with the EU nature policies and conservation action? Um, Michael, I think it's a fair challenge. Do you want to offer a, a view and then we'll move to close? Not sure if I fully understand it. Maybe uh, a diagnosis of the difference between uh, what we have in the state of nature assessment and the broader pan-European exercise that's published today, because we have supported this exercise from, from the start. It is in the context of the EU countries already uh, being reflected in the state of nature assessment, but maybe there are some uh, better, broader understandings on species that can come from this latest uh, assessment. And I, I would invite colleagues in bird life maybe to maybe if to do do that diagnosis and inform us we certainly use the red data list it's as i tried to explain earlier it really does inform our policy our biodiversity strategy and it informs our funding including in relation to life prioritization but if we're missing something that has come out i i, I think we're joined up but if we can be even better at doing so then of course we are open to doing that 
We have a reporting group uh, in relation to the Birds Directive, which is led by my colleague Angelica Rubin, and I refer to her. She's leading on this work. And if there are some further reflections that are needed in the context of today's publication, then of course we would be open to doing so, so that we are absolutely making sure that our conservation priorities are focused on the really most important issues. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and you know, conservation is dynamic. And so I, I think you're right. We try to make sure that finite effort is focused on the most important priorities and that regulatory and financial and policy reform drives us. So thank you for being open. And you know, thank you to everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this session today. Um, a huge thank you to the authors of the um, report, particularly Anna, Ian and Claire, um, to the contributors and many hundreds, including Sylvia, um, Mikhail, for his great support, as well as the funding for the report, uh, and of course our partners, IUCN. Um, as I say, this week the Kunming Declaration uh, was signed, committing countries to really ambitious biodiversity action over the coming decade. Uh, and I think the Red List today that we have launched is really hopefully the, the latest stimulus for us all to step up our action. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you for the publication. Do read it, do send us in any more questions you have. Very happy to um, answer those uh, and uh, best wishes for the rest of your Thursday. Take care, everybody. Thank you.